Imagine unlocking secrets hidden deep within the human body. You know, turning these incredibly rare things that happen into, well, universal hope for millions. Today on the Dupt app, we're doing exactly that. We're plunging into one of the most exciting um, new chapters in the global fight against HIV. And this isn't just about like small steps forward. It's about the very real possibility of a cure. Our sources today, uh, reports from OPB, OHSU, KGW, like they're highlighting this huge federal grant that's fueling some pretty groundbreaking research. Yeah, and our mission today is really to go uh, way beyond just the headlines. We're going to explore what this this really significant funding actually means, who the key players are. And believe me, some of them are these um, extraordinary patients you're about to hear about. And of course, the profound real world implications for, well, over 40 million people affected by HIV around the world. So prepare for some serious aha moments, I think, as we uncover how these seemingly impossible, really rare cures could actually lead to a scalable global solution. Okay, so that monumental federal grant you mentioned, let's start there. It's been awarded to OHSU and its collaborators, right? Led by Dr. Jonah Sacha. That's right, Dr. Sacha. It's an $8.4 million five-year project from the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. Wow, $8.4 million. That's a massive injection of resources. It really is. And you mentioned something about it being a merit award. What's what's special about that? Especially, you know, with NIH funding these days. Uh, yeah, that's a great point because... Getting a merit award, especially for that kind of money right now, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty incredible, honestly. To give you some context, the um, the current climate for NIH funding, well, there have been significant cuts, and there's a lot more scrutiny, especially on primate research centers. Mm. So for this specific project to not only get the funding, but this particular kind of award, this merit designation, it just really underscores how important the NIH thinks this work is, the potential they see in it. Okay, so it's like a big vote of confidence. Exactly. It signals a strong belief in the project's ability to deliver. And it also means, crucially, if the team makes good progress, the grant could potentially be extended for another five years. Ten years of funding, potentially. That's huge. Massive. So that federal backing is obviously critical. But what really makes this research, while well, personally compelling for me, are the individuals at its heart. This is where it gets really interesting, I think. We're talking about... Adam Castillo, who you might know as the London patient, mm. Paul Edmonds, the City of Hope patient, and Mark Frank, the Dusseldorf patient. And what unites these three men is just this incredibly rare thing. They were cured of HIV, actually cured. Amazing. And get this, Dr. Sosaka actually brought these three men together in person in Hawaii earlier this year, sat down with them, pitched the idea of participating in this research. And now they are literally, as the reports say, giving their very selves to the cause. What's driving that that generosity? Yeah, it's it's deeply inspiring, isn't it? Their motivation, I mean. These men, they want to share their stories, obviously, but also actively participate. They want to help scientists understand how they were cured. They're really driven by this hope, you know, not just of improving lives for others, but ultimately contributing to a cure that's scalable, something that can reach millions. They really are, as you said, ambassadors of hope. And hearing them talk about it, it just brings it home. Adam Castillo, he's 45, British Venezuelan. He describes his cure like winning the lottery, a second chance at life. Hmm. And he's dedicated himself to being a global ambassador, saying, and this is a quote, we need to find a cure for everyone. Wow. Then there's Mark Frank, 56, from Germany. He calls his transplant anniversary his 12th birthday. A new beginning. Exactly. The beginning of a new life, he says. And he believes eradicating the virus is the best way to get rid of the stigma, too. He stresses, you have to think globally about viruses. Oh, true. And finally, Paul Edmonds, 70, from yeah. the U.S. He remembers Timothy Ray Gum. The original Berlin patient. Right. And he hopes this research will lead to a cure for everyone around the world. Their commitment is just, yeah, yeah it's palpable. Truly remarkable people. So how did this happen, this incredible, almost, you know, miraculous thing for these patients? What's the common thread? Well, the common thread is that they all receive something called allogeneic stem cell transplants. But importantly, these weren't initially for HIV. They were treatments for cancer, things like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or acute myeloid leukemia. Okay, so a cancer treatment led to an HIV cure. How does that work? Yeah, well, these procedures, first off, they are incredibly risky, mm -hmm. really dangerous. What they do is intentionally kill off the patient's own immune system, wipe it out completely, and then they replace it with stem cells from a healthy donor. So you essentially get a stranger's immune system. Exactly. A complete reboot of the immune system. 
Now, while this can cure certain cancers, it's perilous. Patients can die during the transplant process itself, and others might develop chronic graft-versus-host disease. That's where the new donor immune cells actually attack the recipient's body. It can be a painful, lifelong condition. That sounds brutal. It is. But what's fascinating, and researchers have known this for, gosh, over a decade now, is that this procedure sometimes also completely wipes out the HIV virus which, as you know, is famously stubbornly impossible to fully clear otherwise. Right. So it's a side effect almost, but a profound one. You said 10 people have been cured this way so far. That's the count to date, yes. 10 individuals. And there's something striking about most of them, right? Something about the donors. Yes, exactly. Eight out of those 10 received stem cells from donors who had a very specific and relatively rare genetic mutation. It's a variant of the CCR5 gene. CCR5. Okay, what does that do? Hmm. Well, think of it like this. HIV usually uses the CCR5 protein as a doorway to get into immune cells. But this particular genetic variant, this mutation, it basically changes the lock on that door or removes the doorway altogether for some types of HIV. So the virus just can't get in. The new immune system built from these donor cells is naturally resistant to the most common strains of HIV. So Mark Frank, for instance, his donor had that specific variant. That's right. His cure involved that CCR5 element. Okay, but wait. If 8 out of 10 had that variant, that means two of them didn't. Exactly. So they were cured of HIV even without getting cells resistant via that specific CCR5 mutation. Yes. And that, yeah. that's a really critical piece of the puzzle, a real aha moment, yeah. potentially. Right. What does that suggest? Well, it strongly suggests there's more going on than just that one genetic factor. There must be other immune responses, other cellular mechanisms at play that contribute to clearing the virus during this transplant process. Maybe it's related to that graft versus host effect. Maybe other immune cells get activated. That's the missing puzzle piece they really want to find. So it's not just about the resistance cells. It's about the whole immune system reset, perhaps. That's the hypothesis. Unlocking that mystery, understanding the complete picture of the immune response in all these cured patients, not just the CCR5 aspect, is precisely what Dr. Sasha's team is setting out to do. Okay, so with these incredible individuals, Adam, Mark, and Paul, and their, well, their invaluable biological gifts, their cells, what exactly will the researchers do now? How do they get from cells in a lab to understanding the cure? Right. So the objective is very focused. They'll take biological samples, specifically white blood cells, directly from these three men. Then they'll run a whole battery of experiments on these cells. The goal is to really deeply understand and describe the exact immune responses that led to the cures in these specific individuals. What made their immune reset successful against HIV? And they're comparing this data too, right? Yes, that's key. They'll compare the data from Adam, Mark, and Paul with data they already have from macaque monkeys. These monkeys were cured of SIV simian immunodeficiency virus, basically the monkey version of HIV, in a study Dr. Sacha's lab published back in 2023. So comparing human cures with animal model cures. Exactly. That comparative approach helps identify the really fundamental mechanisms that are likely conserved across species, pointing towards the most crucial elements for a cure. And let's be really clear here. The ultimate goal isn't just understanding, right? It's not about doing more of these super risky stem cell transplants. Absolutely not. That's just not a viable, scalable solution for the millions who need it. It's far too dangerous and complex. So the real aim is to use this knowledge, this understanding gleaned from these rare cases to design something totally new. Precisely. A new therapy, something much safer, something broadly applicable, a genuine cure for HIV. What might that look like? I mean, are we talking pills, injections? Well, Dr. Sanchez has painted a pretty hopeful picture. He envisioned something potentially uh, roughly analogous to new CAR T cell therapy. CAR T, okay, that's the thing where they engineer a, a patient's own immune cells, right? Train them to fight cancer. Exactly. It's a revolutionary approach. So applying a similar principle, maybe training immune cells to find and destroy HIV-infected cells that hide out in reservoirs. He hopes for, potentially, a single infusion where a patient could be done after a week-long stay at a clinic. Wow, a single infusion. Or even, he suggests maybe more ambitiously, a single outpatient visit where you go in and get one injection in your shoulder. From lifelong daily pills to potentially one shot, that's, that's transformative. It's a radical shift. That's the dream. That future sounds absolutely incredible. Turning this dangerous, complex transplant into maybe a simple shot. That, I think, is the ultimate aha moment for so many people listening. A universal, accessible cure. But, okay, let's be realistic. How far away is that? What are the big hurdles? 
scientifically or logistically? And what's the timeline look like? Yeah, it's definitely an ambitious goal, no question. But the development path is pretty standard, though rigorous. These experimental therapies, whatever form they take, will first have to be tested extensively for safety and efficacy, first in mice. Then, if that looks promising, they move to non-human primates, building on that SIV research we mentioned. Okay, animal models first. Right. And if all goes well, if those trials are successful, the team is aiming to launch human clinical trials in as little as uh, five years. Five years to human trials. That actually sounds quite fast in medical research terms. It's ambitious, but reflects the urgency and the potential they see. And it's important to touch on the ethics again here, too. Dr. Sacha has been very clear that any credit or indeed any profit that might come from a resulting discovery, it absolutely should be shared with the three patients participating. He explicitly said we couldn't do this without them, which is just so true. That's really important. Acknowledging their foundational role. Okay, so let's broaden out. What does all this mean for you listening and for the wider world? Before we get into the global impact, let's just quickly recap the core insight here. What seems to be emerging is that by studying these incredibly rare cases, scientists are unlocking the precise how of an HIV cure, mm -hmm. which then paves the way for designing targeted, hopefully non-toxic therapies. It's moving from just managing the disease to actually trying to eradicate it. Exactly. And that shift is critical when you look at the global picture. Which is? Well, the numbers are still staggering. There are over 40 million people living with HIV today. That's the highest number at any point in human history. And tragically, more than 600,000 deaths still occur every single year worldwide from HIV-related causes. So despite treatments, it's still a massive crisis. Absolutely. And new infections, unfortunately, continue to outpace the efforts of our current main tool, which is antiretroviral therapy, or ART. We really need to understand the limitations of ART. Right. ART has been life-saving, obviously, but it's not a cure. Not a cure. Mm. It's a game changer, yes. It controls the virus brilliantly, allows people to live full, healthy lives, prevents transmission. But the virus itself is clever. It's a retrovirus, meaning it weaves its genetic material right into our own human DNA. It hides out in reservoirs in the body. So if you stop RT, even after decades, as Dr. Saja puts it, the virus will bounce right back. So it requires lifelong treatment. Lifelong adherence, which brings its own challenges. It's not universally accessible or affordable across the globe, sadly. And even for those with access, long-term RT can carry health burdens, increase risk of certain cancers, opportunistic infections, diabetes, heart disease, even potentially accelerated aging and a slightly reduced lifespan compared to the general population. So a true cure would eliminate all of that. The need for daily pills, the long-term health worries, the access issues. Precisely. It would be a complete game changer on a global scale. Which is why the hope generated by this new research feels so vital. Dr. Sacha sounds quite confident, actually. He believes, and you quoted him earlier, I think within our lifetimes, for sure, we will see a cure. He does sound optimistic, based on the science. And this new grant, this incredibly focused research with Adam, Mark, and Paul, it feels like more than just a step. It feels like a potential leap towards making that cure a tangible reality. It really does. And this raises, I think, a really important point. How does this kind of research, you know, in, intensely studying these anomalies, these rare exceptions, how does that fundamentally shift our whole approach? How does it accelerate the path, not just to better management, but to genuine global eradication and finally, hopefully, the elimination of the stigma that still surrounds HIV? Turning exceptions into the rule. That's the goal. What an incredible deep dive this has been. Really powerful stuff. We've explored uh, what feels like a genuinely pivotal moment in HIV research, a moment fueled by major funding, yes, but maybe even more powerfully by the just incredible generosity and hope of these three individuals who literally embody a cure. Yeah. And I think this deep dive really shows us that a future where HIV is actually cured, not just managed. Mm -hmm. It's not some distant sci-fi fantasy anymore. It's becoming slowly but surely a tangible reality. Mm -hmm. One that could be safe, accessible, and maybe even just a single infusion away from millions of people worldwide. So as you reflect on the stories you've heard today, the stories of Adam, Mark, and Paul, maybe consider the immense power held within individual experiences, how they can spark these huge scientific breakthroughs with the potential to transform global health. And maybe ask yourself, what other massive challenges might we overcome if we took the time to really deeply study those rare exceptions, those seemingly impossible occurrences? Could they hold the keys to solutions for everyone? 